Um, our, our last uh, uh, speaker uh, uh, of the day, uh, Stein, he will talk about uh, uh, Ansible, uh, introduction to, uh, to Ansible. And so, uh, uh, have fun. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, great. So, I'm really glad that there's so many of you here. I've never given a talk in front of a, such a packed uh, audience, I think. So I'm really excited to be here. It's my first time on FASTEM. Uh, probably not the last, but it's been a lot of fun. So it's an honor to close, uh, have the final talk uh, of this session. So uh, my name is uh, Stein Inge. Uh, I come from Norway. and I work for a consultancy company called uh, Beck. Uh, there's no use in advertising for that because we only have Norwegian customers. So, but anyways, that's where I work. Um, I'm usually doing most of my work with the uh, cloud and AWS, using Terraform and such. Uh, but I've also spent a lot of time using Ansible uh, on previous projects. So this talk is actually I made this talk uh, actually quite many years ago, uh, but I've given this talk at many conferences since because it seems like people are really interested in Ansible and it is an excellent tool uh, for configuration management, I find. Um, more about me, I'm, I'm uh, quite uh, uh, interested in uh, community work, like software community-wise. Uh, I. Uh, I founded the DevOps uh, meetup back in Norway, which has had a great success with, uh, I think, maybe 1,500 members or so. We've also organized DevOps days two times in Norway now. So enough about me. Uh, as Walter said, I'm going to give an uh, introduction to Ansible. Uh, and the example is quite simple. Uh, it's not about like thousand machines in the cloud or something. We're going to use four machines. Um, and this setup is mostly useful for smaller environments. There's no containers. There's no like uh, this new fancy cloud technology in this. But it's, uh, I think, a very good way to uh, provision uh, servers and deploy to them without downtime uh, when you're not in that kind of environment. Uh, I'd also like to mention that my slides can be found online uh, and there's also source code of all the examples uh, and also some slides for a full tutorial. I sometimes do this um, tutorial uh, in half a day or a full day. so. You can watch the slides, and you can check out the source code, and you can do all these tasks yourself if you want to get more into it. I'm going to start off uh, fairly easy uh, with what's the provisioning framework. Um, it's a lot of things, but it's at least these three. It's automation of server setup. It's configuration as code code it, then you run it, and it's not immutable in itself. For it to be immutable, you'd have to destroy the servers and build everything again. Because if you use a provisioning framework to provision something and you forget to remove that configuration, uh, you will uh, eventually have snowflake servers. Some examples of what you can use it for. Uh, you can create users on your boxes, install software, you can generate and manipulate config files on the servers, start and stop and restart processes, and you can set up dependencies between operations that you want to do. There's, of course, a lot of other things you can do with the provisioning framework, but these are some. There's a difference between uh, imperative and declarative ways of provisioning or running something to change the state on a server. 
You might do it this way, the imperative way, where you write a bash script, um, where you have to do all this kind of uh, handling of unexpected uh, things that can happen when you run this script. So here we are installing Vim. Uh, if it's already installed, we have to check for that first. We won't do it. And then we want to add a line, file indent uh, off, inside this uh, config file. And you have to, uh, and then you have to check if it's already there. Uh, and if something goes wrong, how would you roll back? So you can easily see that this way of provisioning uh, can turn into a nightmare. Because these scripts will get really, really big and really, really messy, and there will be a lot of bugs, I can guarantee you. Whereas a declarative way of provisioning servers, like Ansible does, um, you describe a state that you want the machine to be in. And with a declarative way, uh, you can ensure that the machines will be in the state that is described in your declaration. So no need for writing rollback code or uh, error handling or things like that. That's handled by the framework. So if you can run this a thousand times, first time it will install Vim and insert the line. Next time it just won't do anything. And if it crashes, it won't do anything either. So you fix your bug and run it again. Some pros. Uh, it's in source control, which is, uh, of course, very nice. It's documentation. So it's code is the best documentation that you can get. All other docu documentation will be wrong. Refactoring is really easy. You can run your uh, playbooks or your, um, your provisioning against servers. And if you want to change something, you add something, then you can do that, and the state will change. So it's easy to refactor. Get, of course, less differences between environments. It's deterministic, meaning that when you run it, you will know that what state your machine will be in. And of course, prevents manual steps taking the human out of the equation. You know, humans are uh, always uh, the problem when we have problems in software. They're always the, the reason why things go wrong. It's very fast and easy to configure up a new environment. If you've done it once, uh, like we have done on, uh, I will use Vagrant boxes here and I, for testing my setup. And it's very easy for me to provision a server in production. Um, it's easier to test. Yeah. And there's probably more cons, but it's, it's this. It isn't really immutable, which has bitten me quite many times because I'm writing these huge Ansible configurations and then I find out that, no, I don't want to do this task. Then I delete it, I run the script again. The problem is that the state hasn't changed on the server because that's still there. If I install some software package and just remove the code and run it again, the software package will still be there. So that's, uh, that's a pretty large con and something that you have to think about. So if you install some software package, you have to also write the task to remove it if you want to remove it. And what's special about Ansible is that it's SSH based. So all you need is SSH uh, client and SSH on your machine. Uh, it's client only, so no server. Uh, so uh, you don't have to install anything on the server to make it work, like uh, for instance with Puppet and Chef and stuff. It uses YAML configuration. It pushes uh, your changes to the servers. Um, there's also a possibility for pulling from the servers too. Ansible has that. I've only used the push version. I like to run my playbooks against the servers and see what happens instead of something mysterious happening on my servers where something like sinks into uh, a state because I want to get notified 
or know straight away if something goes wrong. It supports more than setup and provisioning. For instance, like I'm going to show you application deployment and also remote command execution. So these days I work mainly with cloud and I use Terraform a lot for provisioning the infrastructure of my cloud. I still use Ansible for things like configuration management on servers because Ansible is better than Terraform on that. Like, for instance, configuring uh, services, installing stuff. I can do that after I provision my infrastructure in the cloud, or uh, I can do it as a building of my images that I am are going on beforehand, before I'm going to deploy new machines to, uh, to the cloud. So I'll try to do a live demo too. So I'm using Vagrant which, uh, and VirtualBox. VirtualBox is the virtualization of the machines on my, uh, uh, on my machine uh, that act as servers. Uh, and I use Vagrant for provisioning uh, those boxes. Uh, I've already run Vagrant up because it takes some time. So if I run it again, it won't take uh, that much time. So I bring up four boxes, a DB, two app servers, and a proxy. That's what I need for our example. So let's have that just running in the background. I'll talk a little bit about the layout of Ansible repositories. Um, Ansible uses convention over configuration. And so you shouldn't try to make your own uh, structure of your source code. If you do that, it will just be a lot of work. So just stick to how Ansible recommends uh, to structure your code and you'll be fairly well off. Otherwise, you will have to write a lot of code to sort of include stuff from everywhere and things like that. Um, it has a general config file where you put some like um, uh, config that should apply for uh, Ansible and for all your runs of Ansible. Uh, it has a hosts file where you specify all the hosts that you're going to uh, provision. I'll have a look at that. It has a site YAML, which is your main playbook. In Ansible, your uh, scripts are called playbooks. That's your main playbook where you sort of tie everything together, and that's what you run. You can specify variables in many different ways. Group vars would be like all application servers or all DB servers, the uh, var variables uh, for those. Uh, whereas host vars is per host. So app server 1, app server 2, db server 1, db server 2. And you name those files after a group or a specific host. You can even use IP addresses if you want. Uh, and then you have roles where your playbooks that does things uh, on your servers are located. You have files. Yep. The role has a name, and that right, role is included uh, by your site YAML file. Um, you have files inside each role, which are files that you want to copy to the remote servers. You have templates, if you want to template files and write them to the server. You have handlers. Handlers are uh, sort of things like restarting a service, for instance. So if you change some config, on a service on your server, you want it to be restarted. And then you can call those handlers from your playbook. Uh, and tasks are what you want to uh, perform on the servers. And vars is variables specific for that uh, special role. So let's try and run Ansible. So all my machines are up. And I'll run my playbook like this. Um, 
And this is also something that took uh, some time, so I've already done this <laughs> before. I'll do the rest of the tasks, I won't do it uh, like this, but downloading Java and stuff took some time. So you can see it's all green, everything is okay on the boxes. So let's have a look at some of the files I mentioned. In the Ansible config, we have like general configuration, like which host file should I use? Uh, what is my remote user? So who should I SSH into? Uh, as and then su to root usually. Uh, some disable host key checking. Uh, the private key file. When you're using Vagrant, it has like this insecure private key file that you use when you're testing stuff. Yeah, and some uh, other uh, things that you'll have to look up yourself. So my host file looks like this. Uh, I have only one DB server, two app servers, and one proxy. So this is the name of the servers, and this is the groups. Um, have a look at the site file. Uh, this is really simple for now. I'm only provisioning the app servers, so I'm saying that the hosts should be the group app servers. And the role is Java, so I'm just installing Java. Um, and installing Java looks uh, like this. Uh, I add an apt repository and I use apt to install the Java JRE, the runtime environment. Cool. Um, Ansible uh, gathers facts from the servers that you provision so that you can use a lot of information about the server, uh, what's accessible on the server uh, for determining what you want to do. If this is the case, then do this. If it is this Linux distro, distro, run this playbook. If it's this Linux distro, run this. Uh, find the, yeah, you can find all sorts of facts about the servers. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, you, can, you can access those facts in your playbooks and also in templates that you write. So if you want to get to my IP addresses for your config files or something, you can use facts. Let's see what that looks like. As you can see, you get all sorts of facts about the machines. There's just so much stuff here that may or may not be useful. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to go through all those. So now we're getting to the task. What we're going to do in this uh, workshop or this uh, presentation. We're going to create an app user called DevOps with a home directory and an SSH key, which is uh, my uh, public key on my machine. We need to set up uh, a database uh, and use Nginx as a reverse proxy and a load balancer. We're going to install uh, the Java application as a service. We're going to deploy uh, this Java application uh, that uses all this stuff that I have provisioned. So our final infrastructure will look like this. Ansible has really, really great documentation. So if you go to this URL, list of all modules, they have a lot of modules, uh, and you'll get very good documentation with examples. So first thing we're going to do is that simple, we're going to install Vim because VI, I always type Vim, so it's really frustrating to go into a server and I type Vim and it says, oh, command not found, that's so, okay, VI. So I always install Vim. And all this code is uh, structured in branches in Git, so it's quite easy to do the, the workshop 
uh, just by checking out the branches and you can see what goes on. Uh, and this is how the playbook looks like. Um, so this is basically what you saw uh, in the beginning. And just to make sure that I'm not cheating to log on to one of the servers. see that file indent is not there and then oops it's already there actually oh <laughs> I must have used a newer distro anyway so so here you can see an option that I'm using uh, tags uh, and I tag all the tasks that have something to do with Vim, with Vim, as you can see here, I have tags, Vim, which is really useful if you've already provisioned a lot of stuff, you don't want to wait for a long time for it to check all the tasks, you just want to run uh, the Vim tasks to speed up things. All right. Oh no, it's uh, it's in task one. Ugh, app is such a mess. See it, Vim is already installed, but the, the file type indent off is not uh, it's not there. Oh, it's wrong. Yeah, so now you can see it. We've installed software and we've manipulated some files. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about variables in Ansible. Uh, it's a very good idea to use variables as much as you can and don't hard code what could have been a variable inside your playbooks. And that's because that's what we call infrastructure as data. Because have, if you have all the variables, all their data in variable files, then it's a lot easier to, for instance, migrate to a different provisioning framework. Because you have all your data, all your facts, uh, nicely inside some uh, configuration files. And not scattered around your playbooks. And the question is, where should you define your variables? Because Ansible has very many options. Uh, as you can see here, you can define it in the hosts file, in the group files and host files in your playbook. Uh, you can use facts, local facts, or server facts, or you can also specify it on the command line. Uh, the way you access them is by uh, double curly brackets and the name of the variable. Um, my recommendation is to uh, use as few of these possibilities as uh, possible uh, and try to stick to one way of defining variables. There might be some reasons for using different techniques. For instance, if you have variables that are specific to one module or one role, then it might be a good idea to have it there. And we'll use a little bit of both. So next task is to create uh, the user. So we want it to have a home directory an SSH key so we can SSH into the box and we're going to use group bars. So 
first thing I do is that I create a file inside GroupWise called App Servers, the same name as my group, and then I describe some variables. The name of the user, which group, and a username that I'm going to use as a comment for my user. And my role looks like this. Um, Ansible has uh, uh, tasks for uh, creating a group and for creating a user. And I'm using variables uh, for those tasks. Let's try to run that, and that should be fairly quick. Yeah. And then I limit it to the app server, so I don't want to run through all the other servers. I skip tags instead of including tags. So I'm skipping apt, vim, and java. And that was pretty fast. And to see that I actually created the user, you can run this command. The vagrant SSH command that you saw me use earlier. Uh, Like a, a built-in uh, vagrant thing that lets you SSH in as the vagrant user. But this is uh, uh, the, the, now I'm using plain SSH. As you can see, I have uh, the user. And it has uh, the .ssh directory with my public key in it. So now we've created the user, which we're going to use as an application user, which is going to run the application. Next thing we're going to do is to install and configure uh, our database. Uh, in this task, we're going to use group bars all. If you have a file inside group bars, which is called all, then it means it goes for all the groups in Ansible uh, by convention. Or you could use group bars DB servers. But if you have all, sometimes variables are useful for uh, more than one group. For instance, a DB user and a DB password. I'm going to use a handler to restart Postgres. If uh, I've changed some config between runs, I want it to restart uh, the server. Um, yeah. Let's check out task three. Um, this is some variables. And here I can see that I uh, specify the variables a little bit differently. Here I use a uh, uh, key uh, and values. So here my top level is Postgres. Then I have, uh, which is the key, and then I have uh, more variables under there. And the same with DB. I'll show you how that works. Yeah, so here is I'm also creating a template. Uh, and here you can see I'm using the variable db.name, db.user, and postgresql.address in my template. And this is my handler. Uh, specify a service, what name of that is, and the state I restarted. So I can call that handler from my playbook like this. Uh, oh, this just installs Postgres with apt. It copies a file, the, like the main Postgres config file. Uh, and then it uses a template, which I show, showed you. Uh, and then I write notify 
restart Postgres, which was the name of my handler. So every time this file changes, I notify uh, this handler to restart Postgres. And the nice thing is, yeah, also for this, this file, the copying of the file, if that's a new file, and also restart Postgres. But if both these tasks have changed, it will wait until the last task has finished and then restart Postgres. So it will only restart it once, depending on what's changed. Uh, but I must ensure that it is started. If it's started, then this task will just pass. And I'm creating a database. Uh, Ansible has quite a few uh, tasks for uh, Postgres and uh, MySQL and other um, databases. So they have this task called PostgreSQL DB, PostgreSQL uh, user, and so on. Let's try to run that. I limit it to the DB servers and I use the Postgres install tag. So it'll just do that. This will uh, damn apt. Oh, my some kind of network? No, oh, that's, uh, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, I see. You know what I'll do? Connect to my phone. Okay, cool. Let's just... Uh, just continue while this runs. So I'll uh, log on and log on to the database later. Uh, so the progress so far is that we've installed and configured a database and a database user. So now the next thing we're going to do is that we're going to deploy our application. I created a really small, not fancy Java application with no GUI. Well, it's got a GUI, actually. But it's um, and then we're going to have a look at some of the files, because this is, uh, there's something, there's some stuff here that uh, you need to know about. What I have is that I have uh, a file which is my service script. So I'm going to install this as a service. So that's actually just a, a basic service script that starts the Java process. Uh, and I have a template where my config, so here goes my like, database config, which database should I connect to and, and so on. And then I'm going to explain about the serial one. Um, so database is actually installed. Um, let's have a look at the site, YAML. You can see that I've uh, uh, I to check out the next task, sorry. Yeah, and then you can see that uh, I've set on the app servers, I've set serial one. The reason for this is that Ansible uh, usually does things in parallel. So if it can parallel its operations against more servers, it does that. 
And that's a good thing. But if you want to deploy an uh, application uh, without downtime, you have to take one application at a time. So I'm saying that it should only take one server at a time. You can also specify, like, uh, do only 10 servers at a time, for instance. But in this use case, we use uh, one at a time. So, yeah, let's have a quick look on the, at the playbook 2. So what I do is here is that I use the template of my config properties and place it in the home directory of the DevOps user. There's some credentials. And then I copy uh, the application uh, from the Hello World Java app folder to the same destination. And then I'm going to explain the rest of the playbook after I've run it. You can see that it fails on this task, but I've actually ignored that because the first time, usually the script will stop if it fails, but I've put on a tag that said ignore this uh, error. And that's because the app hasn't been deployed before, so there is no previous version of this app. Uh, because this uh, special task, it gets the previous release version of the app. It happens to both servers. Let's see if that works. Yep. The app says I'm alive on app one. And the DB says an exception occurred. There's no DB yet. So what just happened? On the server, it will look like this. Uh, I've copied in the config properties file, or the template. And then I've set, uh, this is the file that I uploaded. And I've set, and I've symlinked to that with current. The reason it failed for setting the previous was that there was no previous uh, application there. But what, I, what it would have done is to set the other as previous. We'll do that in a minute. And here are the, the files, and I have some logs and uh, a service script inside uh, for starting it as a server. So that went well. I'll do it again, and then it won't fail, because then there is a previous version of the application there. And it does it on one host at a time and not in parallel. So we've deployed the application to two of the app servers and enabled it as a service. Next thing we're going to do is like deploy the database schema so that the app doesn't say error from the database. Uh, so what I do is that I've created a really simple database migration script. Have a look at it. Which just does this. It creates a schema called DevOps and it uh, creates a ta table called hello and it inserts hello from database. That's what's going to turn up in our app after we've run it. Um, and here I'm using uh, an Ansible task called command. And this task you should almost never use because the command task, it just fires off a command and Ansible has no way of knowing if it was successful or not. 
So you should use uh, the other tasks that it has if you can. Uh, but sometimes, like for instance, running uh, uh, a script, if you can't do that with a, with a different task, a proper task, then you have to use the command. You can also write some conditions for when uh, a command should be successful or not. But it's just a big mess, so try to avoid using command. Let's try to deploy the database. Just really fast. Then hopefully, oh, the DB says hello from database. Way we've deployed our application and it's working. But there's so much load on this page, so we have to load balance it. It's starting to get crazy. <laughs> yeah, and you can also log on to the server and use the command line client up there, but we'll not do that. You can see that it works. So last thing we're going to do is to set up the proxy. Um, and as you've seen, I've used templates, and the templating language that we are using is Jinja. And Jinja has a lot of functionality that you can use to uh, create quite advanced templates, like loops and stuff like that. So I'll show you an example of that. Here is my load balancing code. It's an Nginx config file. And as you can see, I'm using a for loop. So I'm looping over the app server group. And then I'm inserting uh, the name of the app server, which port, yeah, and which port. So that means I have two app servers, so it will loop through that and add one config file for each server I have in that group. Oh, you can see it? In the terminal? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Like that. Now you can see it. Yeah, now you can see the for loop at the top there. Where I'll loop through the app servers. Thank you for letting me know. Um, right, the other stuff is quite straightforward. It installs and configures Nginx. So, yeah, there you have the. I had it here to the loop. So. Let's try to run that. Work on my phone was pretty slow, so come on. Yep. Right, so now it's installed Nginx. Now our proxy should be on this address. As you can see, switching between the two servers. App one and app two. Now we can uh, now the load has gone halfway down. <laughs> it's such a popular site that you probably set up more nodes soon. Yep. Almost done, I think. What? Okay, so.
So, just a short note about what makes it zero downtime. Uh, it's usually the problem with zero downtime deployment is the database, right? Because migrating, migrating the database, that means that your old version of your application and your new version of your application might not be able to use the same schema. That's why we use the expand contract pattern. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that will make the application compatible, both, uh, both applications compatible with the same schema, like adding tables, adding columns, tweaking indexes, and stuff like that. You can use that before you deploy. But, and after both of them are deployed, you can remove a lot of stuff that you don't need anymore. So you can almost all the time do something before you deploy the applications, and then you can clean up after you've deployed it. So it looks a little bit like this. Uh, we pre-upgrade the DB with stuff that are uh, compatible with both versions. We upgrade one of them. We upgrade the other. And then we post-upgrade. Then we do the stuff that makes uh, the applications incompatible after they've uploaded to the latest version. Yeah, I'm actually done. Uh, but some suggestions for further uh, investigation is uh, to use the expand contract pattern to change the table name of the database and deploy yeah and, and deploy that without downtime and then implement rollback that's some suggestions that was all I had and we have time for questions right. There's some option that means that you can run it, uh, for several servers uh, at the same time. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. So, so to repeat the question is that can you do stuff in parallel on the same server, like all these tasks on the same servers in parallel? Uh, answer would be no, you can't do that. You have to do it in sequence. Uh, I guess you could have different playbooks and have several runs at the same time perhaps. <laughs> that would maybe be a little bit strange. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I could do that, but then I had to write another task for doing that. But I could do that. I, I could check the output of the previous command and say that this is okay because so and so. I, I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I did it to have less tasks. Yes. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you guys all leave, or while you guys all leave, I have a favor to ask. I have three people outside who could do 